Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Open Up the Workforce. I'm your host, Ava Sadeghi, co-founder and CEO of Simba. Today, we have an exciting store episode in store for you. We have Rachel Winowski, who's the CHRO of AXA XL. She's been doing some pretty exciting things and innovating in the insurance industry. We're excited to have you here with us today. Rachel, can you share our listeners a little bit more about your career and your story and what led you here today? Sure. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you all. I'm really excited to be here. So I have been with AXAXL for about 12 years now. And one of the things that I think actually drew me to, to the opportunity to speak with you is that I began my career as an intern with the organization. So my career has been primarily on the HR business partnering side, but I did begin my career as an internal audit intern. And when I was in college, I remember saying, I want it, I want a career path in HR, but I took the opportunity that was presented to get experience. And being an internal audit with, with the company, I remember saying, okay, audit might not be for me personally, but I love this company and I love the people. And I left on some good terms. And a year later, after graduating, I found myself back in a junior level, a junior level entry position in human resources. And I've been with the organization ever since. So again, growing up on the HR business partnering side, and then most recently taking on the CHRO role. So having HR functions in addition to business partnering under, under me. So I've I've been afforded the opportunity over the 12 years to really grow and progress with the company. And I can't say enough good things about them. That's incredible. And that's for us, what we think of like a true success story. We think about early careers and I'd love to get your perspective on, you know, how did you, as someone going through that experience, kind of visualize your career path? Was there wraparound support that they provided you? And, you know, how have you been thinking about that for the larger organization to ensure that we have these career pathing mobility structures in place? Yep. So that's a great question. For me, part of it was definitely the environment and the people that I was surrounded with. So I will say some of it was a little bit of luck, right? I was surrounded by really good people. And at the time, I had an incredible boss that really, I think, showed a ton of confidence in the role that she had and wasn't hesitant to ever bring me into into conversations, shadow, educate me. So part of it was the environment, but I think the other piece of it and it is on the onus is on you as an individual. I knew that I had an opportunity being very early on in my career and being surrounded by people that were extremely talented and educated, then I needed to soak that opportunity up and be a sponge and really take advantage of it. So there were things that I was afforded, but I went out of my way to just show that when I was appreciative, but two, I had earned the seat at the table. So even though my age and my experience on paper probably didn't warrant me to be in the room, I ensured that I, you know, understood that I had a lot to learn, but then picked my places to really find ways to add value and earn the respect of the leaders around me. And once I did that, they really brought me along. And so part of it was was just that, right? The environment that was created. But for me, I, I knew that I wanted to be a CHRO very early on in my career. And I think having the courage to say, this is where I want to go, but I know I have an extremely long way to get there and being comfortable and confident enough to say that, I think took some courage, but I think people respected that because they knew that I was going to work really hard for it. And I know I still have a very long way to go in my career, right, as I continue to progress. But as I look back in the 12 years, I think those two things coupled, being thoughtful and having the courage to say it, but then showing up when you need to, to be able to soak in all of that information was kind of the the recipe for success that I found. Thank you for sharing. I feel like there's a lot of great advice woven into there for our listeners. And I feel like through my career, even thinking about when I've shared a destination, even when it's been outlandish as like, I want to build a startup. A lot of people are very excited to help and support. So it is 
being clear on where your vision is and how awesome that you knew early on you wanted to be a CHRO. It's really wonderful. And we need more leaders like yourself in the CHRO role. I'd love to get your perspective on how you're thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, because there's a lot on your plate as the CHRO. So how do you integrate that into your practice and how is that top of mind for you? Yep. So this continues to be a goal for us that's front and center. So not only from an HR perspective, but from a company-wide perspective. And I know that AXA XL and AXA more broadly is committed to building a global workplace and really where colleagues can bring their whole selves to work. We use that saying often and one where, right, everyone's treated with dignity and respect and where individuals feel safe, value, valued and respected. Inclusion and diversity supports AXA's effort to right, nurture a culture, and you'll hear this tagline with our organization of No You Can, and it encourages colleagues to really challenge themselves and one another to learn, grow together as one team, and again, feel like they can truly bring themselves to work. So we spend a lot of time around educating what that what that means and how that feels through different activities, both internally and externally in the workplace. That's beautiful. No, you can. Because in a way, when I think about that, it has an element of empowerment to it, right? It like, real, you can do this. And and if you don't know how, we'll give you the resources and skills and, you know, enable you to do that. So that's a really, really powerful message for others to listen to. I'd love to know what metrics are you keeping track of when you think about actually measuring the inclusion and the diversity that's happening. Yep. So from a leadership team perspective, we've established and cascaded inclusion and diversity goals to all of our leadership team members so that their accountability is consistent across the organization. And then we track those through a quarterly inclusion and diversity dashboard. And that has been a huge part of our our strategy. And we know that many organizations, right, it's not just one pillar, but it's across everything that we do. So that's just one component of it is this dashboard and this goal. And then every colleague, so regardless of what level, what tenure you are in the organization, every colleague has an inclusion and diversity goal that they have as part of their performance and development plan on an annualized basis. And they personally get to customize what that goal looks like and what they'd like to achieve for the year. So our leadership team does have goals, right, that are set out for them specifically to their units, but then every colleague has an IND goal. I think the other piece that I just wanted to highlight on, it's not so much around the metrics, but it's around the accountability. So we have business resource groups, which we do have large engagement from our leadership team. So our leadership team has sponsors we, that that co-sponsor each of our business resource groups. And that can be things like RISE, which is focused on race and ethnicity. We have Pride, which is focused on the LGBTQ plus community. We have LEAD, which is focused on gender equality. And then we also have ENABLE which is focused on colleagues with disabilities. And anybody can join any of those groups. You can be a part of all of them. You can focus on one that you're passionate about. And again, you have exposure to leaders there. And they host a ton of different events throughout the year. Um, the other piece as we think about equality is we've created a leader a leadership team advisory council, and this was done several years ago, but this is also a group of high potential diverse colleagues that act as advisory to the CEO and his direct reports, our leadership team at AxXL. And a lot of the times in that conversation, it's, you know, the topics that come up or why we think it's important from an IND standpoint to bring different perspectives, right, to to our executives who have the seat at the table. And again, it's an extra voice. And this group feels empowered and is actually encouraged to challenge the leadership team and provide feedback to our organization. And I actually have the benefit of being on this this year's cohort. And that's I can say firsthand that's that's the message that we are set to challenge and encourage encourage them to think differently. And so when we think about I and D, it's part of our DNA, right? But that's definitely, definitely front and center for them of different ways we can continue to think 
strategically about about I and D as a whole. Those are great things. Thank you for sharing. I feel like I could get spicy. I can imagine, right? I think yeah. this is actually the first time I've heard of this concept of a cohort actually radically challenging the leadership. Yes. And it's refreshing to think about your approach to this, not just being, you know, the groups and a top a bottom up approach, but also the top down and making sure that everybody has a seat at the table. I think that's really what is needed. And I hope that our listeners are could explore an idea of like this. How do we challenge leaders? One thing you mentioned about the personalized learning and development plans, that is wonderful. And something we saw in Gen Z is they kind of want to see what's up next. How can they see and visualize their future? How do you think about designing these learning and development plans that actually are things that you know you actually want to look at and you're excited about, not things that are maybe required in a performance review? Yeah. So I think that's a great point. And it's probably something from an industry-wide perspective, right? We find ourselves getting stuck in maybe some traditional methods. And so I think there are certainly ways to revamp. This is probably a small step in that direction and use utilizing the I and D goal. But I always encourage colleagues, yes, we're going to have business goals. We're going to have development goals, but that is a two-way street with you and your respective manager. This is not a top-down approach. There are going to be some things, right, and some metrics that we are just going to have to embed because that is that we are a business and we are driving for profitability, right? So there's some things that we know that we have front and center and that we're going to have to achieve. But I really think pe- colleagues should continue to feel empowered to say, here's things that I'd like to do and think creatively and think differently about customizing what their plan looks like. And for me, it's not just, you know, okay, we do a mid-year check-in and then we do a year-end performance review. This should be a fluid document that, okay, we if we need to pivot and you know, goals have changed throughout the year, then we utilize this as, you know, as a conversation that we keep ongoing. To me, it always has such a significant weight, but it historically it's, you know, maybe two times a year, sometimes unfortunately only one time a year. And to me, this is, this is your plan. This is your development and your goals. To me, it should be a part of the conversation continually. I couldn't agree more. And I think we need a lot more of that for early talent to have that support and that guidance. At the beginning of this call, Rachel, you mentioned that you had a really good boss, which a lot of people don't say that. And there's so many books and so many things on how to be a good leader, how to be a good boss, but it's challenging sometimes. There's not enough infrastructure and support and managers become managers so quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, thinking about that when you design these kind of learning journeys for your talent and teams. Yes. So that's a great question. It is something that we have thought about. We actually piloted earlier this year and had really good feedback around a concept of new manager essentials. And this could be twofold. So and we're running another cohort in September. So this is now going to be part of our onboarding experience. So if you're new to the organization and you are a people manager, you will have the opportunity to participate in this new manager essential. And it talks about what it means to be a leader. And it all it also gives a foundation of some of the manager principles specific to our organization and some of the history. So it's if you're a new leader or manager to the organization, you have the opportunity to go. But then also internally, if you grow and get promoted and then take on people manager responsibilities, you now get to participate in this program. And to me, there's something about, right, yes, there's on the job experience and right, you will, that's a huge part of learning. But for me, it's also giving people the space and the opportunity to get in a room with, you know, individuals that are in the same circumstance and figuring out what works, what doesn't work. Here's my experiences from past organizations or growing up within this organization and being able just to level set across the board of what it means to be a leader in this organization. So that is two things within the Americas region, or I'm sorry, two cohorts this year within the Americas region that we have committed to and will now do on an ongoing basis, given the feedback's been quite positive. That's incredible. We love to see successful pilots. We love to see teams trying out new things and innovating. So that's wonderful. And we do need that type of guardrails and support, the resources to ensure success, that teams are empowered when they can support their teams. 
as we did more research and we're excited to connect with you, we saw that AXA Excels has done a lot of great yearly reports on gender pay gaps, ethnicity pay gaps. You might have seen we have our own fair pay for interns. We were part of the paid internship pledge. Can you share a little bit more about that research and maybe what findings have been particularly interesting for you? Sure. So I think, right, this is certainly something globally that we're continuing to care more about. So I think this is a fantastic question and for us has been front and center for quite some time. So within XXL, speak specific to the Americas, right? Of course, we believe in equal pay for equal work. And it's, right, it's socially responsible and quite frankly, right, the right thing to do. So we strongly support pay harmonization and continue to have the commitment to help promote XXL as a great place to work. And this is a huge component of that, right? So our America's compensation team has a strategy in place to ensure that we pay equally and have alignment for colleagues within their role and relevant professional characteristics or, or characteristics and experience. Rachel, this is such fascinating stuff. I feel like I could talk just about this topic for like hours. And we've been following and, you know, really closely aligned with you know, pay transparency because, you know, it's really important. And we do see that oftentimes they're the outliers are oftentimes part of underrepresented groups and how we work to resolve that is going to be really important about how we think about you know opening up the workforce you mentioned that at the annual phase they you know you you inform them of a pay raise do you spend time educating that they were in a different bracket before and I'm, yeah you handle that conversation because it can be intense because you know so much of our psychology and our self-worth is aligned in our pay and our job yeah, so we do. I mean, I think part of this is around being honest and transparent because, you know, from an equity perspective, we have to own that, right? This was a little bit of a journey that we were on. I feel very confident now that we've done this for a few years that the right, the equity ga gaps get less and less. But I think we need to own the message and just to say, hey, listen, right, we we conduct this exercise. It's generally on an annualized basis. You are identified as being out of range. And here's what we are doing to ensure that you now feel confident that you are paid appropriately for this role. And I think a lot of times what ends up happening is you get caught, what we are finding is, is you get colleagues that have progressed so quickly in their career that they can't keep up naturally with the jumps. And right then it's our, our responsibility to help close that gap. And I think if they know that and you're honest about it and they know that you're committed to fixing it, to me, that builds so much more connect from a retention perspective than just kind of dancing around the message of what in the exercise of what you're trying to do. So we really do take that head on and we're, we're very honest with the managers and the colleagues that have been identified, but I'm happy to say the list is continuing to grow quite slim year over year. And if you if we do find colleagues that exist now in the States, there's a story behind it, right? As I just, I, I, one of the examples, right? And it's not just, wow, this is just truly an outlier. So we're we're continuing and committed to doing this on an annualized basis. And it's very much now part of our, our cycle and how we manage compensation. That's profound. And I appreciate the work you're doing there because it's not easy. It takes a lot. And especially to, you know, come forward to say we d didn't get it right and we want to fix it and we want to work on it. And I think people do appreciate that. And it creates a sense of loyalty and continued mm -hmm. commitment to a company and an employer. And I think we hopefully have more organizations following that and in, in your footsteps there in the future. I wanted to also dive into a little bit about employee experience. I know we talked a little bit about onboarding and some of the resources you provide and training. Can you share what areas of the employee experience that you're particularly excited about at AXA Excel? and think there are room for opportunities and growth, maybe in the industry at large. Yep. So I think one of the things I'm really excited about, and this is the press release hasn't even officially come out. So this is this is really fresh off off of the news, is that we are going to have a partnership with Gamma Iota Sigma. 
And that is an international professional group with over 100 chapters nationwide. And they're organized to promote and encourage student interest in risk management and actuarial science, right? Which is which is tied directly to AXA XL. But we've actually signed on as one of the 10 founding partners for its foundation. And that foundation is committed to prioritizing student support in areas of mental health, professional development, and chapter support and accessibility for disabled and veteran students. So our partnership with Gamma will not only be incredible support provided, I think, to thousands of students right across the nation, but will also allow us at AxXL as a company to engage in, with and source diverse talent from numerous schools throughout the U.S. So when I think about the employee experience and our DE&I initiative, this, you know, it, it's more of a lens around a crew attracting and recruiting talent, but that is definitely something that I'm really, really excited about. So that is one thing. The other that I would say is definitely around our employee experience and holistic approach of what it means to ensure, right, that we can bring our co our, our colleagues can bring their whole selves to work every day, which I mentioned earlier. But we really focus on three pillars of health, and that's physical, mental, and financial. But beyond that, I really do feel like from an employee experience, we do have strong leadership commitment to the well-being of our colleagues. And so we recently, and I'm really happy to say this was rolled out last year, but I was a part of establishing an expansion of our family-friendly benefits. And so we offer paid time off now for colleagues that are going through fertility treatments pregnancy loss. If you are a partner and a colleague or you're, you're, you're a partner and you have somebody that is going through pregnancy loss or infertility, but you are there as their partner, you get paid time off to care for them. We have things like grandparent leave that we just rolled out, right? We are really focused on kind of the moments that matter in life. So when we think about our employee experience, right? Everybody has a job to do. It's really important that you, that we set people up so that when life does happen outside of work, which it will, that we have proper protocols in place just to say, here's the baseline and foundation about how we're going to support our colleagues. So those are a few examples. And then one that I will mention that I'm also really excited about is that we recently implemented new free virtual physical therapy solution. And you don't actually even have to have benefits with us to participate. This is open to all colleagues within the Americas. And last year, we enhanced access to comprehensive virtual mental health care so that colleagues can also see a licensed provider in a day rather than having to wait like a certain waiting period or grace period to find a provider they now have this service that they could see someone licensed same day. So I think these are just certain enhancements when we think about our rising health care costs, right? We've chosen to keep contributions flat, but it's these types of things when we think about high inflation and employee experience, right, that we ensure that we do our part from a wellness and benefit factor so that their employee Right, we have a strong employee value prop for our colleagues to say, here's why I work for AXA XL. Well, it's no wonder that you won the Best Employer Award for Health and Wellbeing. <laughs> by the We're very health. excited about that. <laughs> I was like, wow. I, I mean, this is incredible. I feel like if anyone's listening to on learning from you, they're going to probably go look at your jobs portal because you do focus on moments that matter. And it is really inspiring to see that you are being so thoughtful and intentional from the early stage of building that pipeline with early talent, mm -hmm. all the way to ensuring that people can take leave when it's needed and being supported throughout their entire life cycle with you. It's really powerful. Yeah. yeah. And it's something that we'll review on an annual basis, right? So as times change or, or we have the, you know, as new ideas come in from colleagues, our HR team, right? That's, again, it's a very fluid process. So it's not to say we've looked at it once and here are our policies, but this is an annualized review that we do to ensure that we're staying thoughtful about, about those moments that matter. So anything we can do to improve our wellness and some of the policies and leaves that we give colleagues, we'll continue to look at that on an ongoing basis. 
um, so they can tell. I mean, you, even on this call, you've mentioned so many different initiatives that you've rolled out, piloting, trying out, and it's so important to always be listening, but also experimenting on how we can make it better and figuring it out. So that's really critical. For us at Simba, we always like to ask this question before we wrap up the podcast, which is around our mission and tagline for this series, open up the workforce. At Simba, this to us means a future of work that is equitable for access to jobs and wealth creation. We'd love to get your perspective, Rachel, on what do you think leaders need to do in order to open up the workforce? Yeah, so I think that's great. And I love the tagline. And then again, one of the things that I think really drew me to to do this podcast with you and your mission statement. And so for me, I think one of the things that our leaders really need to be thinking of is right, the well-being, the equity piece, a lot of the the things that I talked about earlier. But if I take a different lens and I look at talent development, right, developing and upskilling existing internal talent, I think is one of the most crucial investments that organizations need to make and having leaders be open to train external hires that don't necessarily fit the role exactly, but have those transferable skills and fit the culture and have the leadership behaviors, right? Because as we continue to evolve as a company, whether it's investing in technology, right, con- continuing flex work hours, right, to ensure that we we keep solution-oriented mindset, but everything that we do, right, this is the future generations and things that we're looking for. And it's really important to, I think, look at skills versus the job, right? Because the workforce is continuing, continuing to change. So I think for me, that is, that's front and center and, and thinking about how we alter job descriptions before professional expertise, right? Focusing on what an individual can bring to the table, not necessarily, again, the years of experience or background. And I think part of that to me probably does have a personal impact because if somebody looked at me and looked at professional years of experience, I would not be qualified for almost every single role that I was in. But if you have the skills, right, you need to be thoughtful about where we make the investments in people. But I also think a lot of companies will have to move to the skills-based organization, which for big, large traditional carriers is going to be quite a transition and change effort. But for me, I think if we're going to open up the workforce and give people the opportunities, that is going to definitely have to be a mindset shift that companies are going to have to put front and center now in order to have the impact later. We couldn't agree more with you. We are fully on that train and bandwagon and helping employers build systems and processes that enable them to even do this. But this is the first step. And we appreciate you for sharing so many incredible insights with us and for pioneering so many new ways that must be done in this space. Rachel, I'd love to see if you have anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today. I would just say a big thanks for the opportunity to to be able to have this discussion. And I think what you are doing and bringing, bringing attention to this is really, really important. So I commend you all. And I think I'll just say, you know, I again, encourage people to have the courage to speak up about what they want to do and ensure that you show up day to day and soak up all that you can so that your career goals can really be achieved. Thank you. And on that powerful note, we'll wrap up today's episode. We appreciate you, Rachel. Thank Thank you. you.